Welcome to the Public Voice Salon. We are an open dialogue on education, the arts, and social change. And today we are with one of our favorite guests, Stephen Eric Bronner, distinguished professor from Rutgers University and one of the leading experts on critical theory uh, in the world. Okay, uh, And the kind of person we think should be featured more on mainstream media. Because one thing we notice with the big shows, you know, uh, with MSNBC and CNN, is is they tend to cover what's going on in a way that's very repetitive and there's a good side to that because you need to know what's going on you know but we think there ought to be a space in media for critical education to be able to connect the dots to how we got into this mess to begin with politically with a president who is displaying fascistic qualities where just this past week uh, there was talk uh, by Mr. Clapper, a former security, uh, national security uh, expert who said he thinks that they should possibly invoke the 25th Amendment because of uh, Trump's instability, the fact that he has his finger on the nuclear button, and given his uh, personality characteristics is a very scary thing. And the question then becomes, how did he even get in? What are the, what, what, what are the situations economically, culturally, education that led to this and and we do have a kind of an intellectual domain that looks at this which is called critical theory and so we think uh, that people like Mr. Bronner should definitely be featured more on the big shows on mainstream media and this analysis ought to be not just in a kind of a little uh, ethereal enclave which it is now but in a more broad public situation that people know about this stuff. And, and interestingly, Steve Bronner is able to communicate these very difficult ideas to a broader public in a way that other intellectuals can't, because it's a very as an abstract language, and it be can become very difficult to understand. But Steve makes it very easy to understand. So we want to begin with your analysis of Trump uh, in August of 2017. What do you think is going on? How did this man get elected? And how do we how do we deal with the situation of uh, the threat to democracy that's now being perceived, and possible threat to life on planet Earth? Okay. Yeah. Well, the, the, these are thank you. Uh, but these are pretty big uh, yes. questions. I mean, I think the first thing that's worth thinking about is, in a certain way, Trump isn't an aberration. Uh, you know, uh, it's true that. Politically, we haven't had uh, a fascist takeover. We haven't had a strong, uh, a strong communist party. It's in a way true that the parties, the political parties, veer towards the center, or what Arthur Schlesinger, the Kennedy liberal, called the vital center. Mm. But in a certain way, that obscures more than it uh, explains. Mm. Because in terms of social movements, it's a completely different story. Mm. You, uh, going back to the 19th century, we had the Know Nothings, which was a party, but also a movement. Uh, the name is self-explanatory. <laughs> uh, after that, we had the uh, Ku Klux Klan. More on that in a minute. Uh, after the Ku Klux Klan, and you can think of this as a huge mass movement. The Ku Klux Klan was was not simply the kind of uh, fringe group mm. that it uh, is often described as today. We're talking about marches in the 1920s mm. with hundreds and thousands of people in Washington. Mm. And uh, I think it was Harry Truman who said... Um, you couldn't be elected dog catcher in Missouri unless you were a member of the Klan. Then in the 30s, there was the America Firsters. This is where Trump gets the, uh, the term. Then, uh, the, uh, which was in, included people like uh, Joe Kennedy and, uh, and uh, Charles Lindbergh, who were basically fascists. They didn't want to involve uh, the United States in uh, any... Uh, support for England or the anti-fascist cause. Mm. And then, of course, there's McCarthy, and then there's the silent majority, the uh, moral majority, 
all the different majorities, which are supposedly hidden, but which have a tremendous uh, impact. And in a certain way, Trump's mass base comes out of that. Uh, President Obama said that uh, there's a straight line from Sarah Palin in 2008 to um, uh, President Trump today, and I think that's true. Um, let me put it this way. Mm. When you think of those uh, primaries that Trump won, mm. this was building on a divide and conquer. Mm. He always talks about the 17 candidates he beat. Mm. Uh, and that's true. And uh, the reason was he had a strong base. He knew the base he was playing to mm. directly. Mm. And his more gangster-like qualities... Mm really shine, uh, in a certain way, shine through as against uh, uh, Mario Rubio and uh, Ted Cruz, mm. uh, whom nobody liked mm. Mm. Uh, at the end of the day. Mm. Uh, there's a way in which Trump stands there, which makes one think of Mussolini. Uh, yes. There's uh, And there's a clear base that will support him no matter what. Now, uh, if you think of the election of 2008, there were two wars going on. There, were, uh, there was the Great Recession. And the Republicans put forward probably the weakest presidential ticket in recent history with John McCain and uh, Sarah Palin. S and it's true, uh, President Obama won the electoral vote by a lot. I forgot what it is, actually. But it's also true that he did not win mm. the uh, popular vote by a lot. I mean, we're talking about four mm. or five, four percent or something like that. Mm. And what that means, in my opinion, is that there is a rock-solid group in the United States, maybe a third of the voters, maybe a little more, who would vote for Daffy Duck rather than vote for a progressive or, uh, of course, someone who's black. And I think that, um, that the racism ignited or crystallized mm. all the reactionary tendencies, all, all the fears about modernity, um, about the triumph of expertise, mm. the, uh, the mm. triumph of diversity, mm. the triumph of technology, as against, mm. uh, which calls the uh, small town life into question and right. Right. Uh, calls into question the, uh, react the work of the reactionary elements of the working class. Mm. In, you know, uh, blue the coal. Collar, blue collar work. Uh, you know, or, be, or, be yeah. careful, okay. coal. Yeah. Right? Okay. Uh, I mean, these, uh, it's often said that, the, uh, that uh, these people are, I don't know, we, we pander to them. Well, if you're not going to pander to them, then you have to tell the truth, which is that um, these, the, the industries in which they're engaged are being destroyed by what the great advocate of, uh, of capitalism, Joseph Schumpeter, called its creative destruction. And that means it's constantly destroying um, out of date, um, out of date industries and forms. I wrote my dissertation on it on a oh. on a typewriter. Oh. Yeah, uh, this is almost unimaginable to my students. Oh. <laughs> it was a oh. complete disaster, <laughs> and it seems to me that uh, that we forget that this that capitalism itself is a threat. It explains the fear of elites and the concern uh, of elites, but also the kind of, uh, on the one hand, the hatred of elites. On the other hand, the idea that the privileges, that white privilege is being, uh, white male privilege is being undermined uh, is the, the key component. Um, Critical theory, which you mentioned, always speaks about the uh, one of its most famous concepts is the culture industry, mm. and uh, the culture industry basically um, 
takes ideas, domesticates them, mm. and uh, simplifies them. Uh, you reach the lowest common denominator in order to maximize your profits. Mm. So you think of Leave it to Beaver, and you think of uh, Happy Days, and you think of uh, Father Knows Best, and we can keep going. Uh, my Little Margie. Yes. Um, yeah. Right. Uh, we're dating ourselves. Right. Um, and you, you, uh, and what, what do you see? You see... Uh, Women in the kitchen, you see uh, gays right. in the closet. I mean, they right. don't exist. Right. And if you see a black person, yeah. then uh, it's he's doing a minimum, uh, mm. at the most uh, demeaning job. Mm. Yeah. Mm. From the standpoint of the Tea Party, is ideology. What's key to this is that these groups like the situation they're in, oh. and. Um, the revolt is triggered mm. by people from the outside, mm. right? Mm. Uh, the outside would be intellectuals, it would be uh, Easterners, it would mm. be city people, mm. it would be uh, globalization. You can make this up any number of different ways. Mm. But, the, uh, uh, but at the end of the day, white privilege is being uh, endangered and that of course becomes the attack on uh um in in the modern in the most recent terms um latinos and um uh, and Mus and uh, Isla uh muslim Im immigrants um so there we are mm. that base of trump is it's always said in the media when uh, he gives these provocative talks, mm, you know, mm, um, <laughs> the the famous Charlottesville right, response yes. with the two sides, right. uh, the yes. uh, or if you like the pardoning of Sheriff Joe uh, last Rock, night happened last happened night, happened last night. Yeah. Um, and you you get this sense of wonder mm -hmm. uh, from the, from the mainstream media. Why is why is he doing this? Mm -hmm. Why doesn't he move out to the middle? instead of just remain concerned with the base. My theory on this is if he is the fascist or the aspiring fascist that everybody says he is, then you have to take this seriously. The first thing about a, an aspiring fascist is the, uh, to build and strengthen the cult of the personality. Mm. That means mm. you constantly intensify the loyalty of your base. And if it moves out, you know, if that uh, if that support expands, that's great. It's wonderful, but it's not going to expand. Uh, it's not going. Nothing's going to happen unless your your base or Trump's base is frenzied, zealous, and ever more identifying with him. Mm. Now. Mm. We speak of the 2018 elections. That's very possible that I hope the Democrats uh, will win. Mm, mm. Um, but that doesn't have to be the case. Mm. And one of the things that uh, is clear, uh, seems clear to me, there are two different elements involved. Mm -hmm. One deals with the primaries within the Republican Party. Mm. You note that the people that, uh, like Jeff Flake, mm. like Senator Jeff Flake, yeah. whom uh, uh, Trump is attacking, uh, they're not benefiting from their criticisms of Trump. Mm. It's weird. Mm. Uh, and, and, and the people who are the candidates who are supporting Trump, Kelly Ward and mm. people like this, are benefiting. Now, in off-year elections, the vote is very low. Mm. Republicans always be, uh, are concerned with, uh, or always bank on that. You know, it's a traditional thing. The lower the vote, the better the situation is for Republicans. Mm. Uh, now, if that's true, having an energized mass base within the Republican Party for those primaries can can be a very positive thing, mm. right? 
then when the election takes place between mm. Republicans and Democrats, mm. the claim would be those who those moderates who hate the Democrats or dislike the Democrats and uh, are disgusted with the message, with their message, whatever it might be, mm. some of those will get. But we will have our rock-solid base. And to that extent, uh, the victory of uh, the Democrats in 2018 shouldn't be taken for granted. Mm-hmm. Especially if there's a low turnout. Mm. Well, that makes sense. It does, it does. But uh, I think there is a richness to this discourse. There's a depth of it that one, again, rarely sees on mainstream media, uh, which helps us really ana- analyze what's going on and, and, and to make sense of it, to try to fix the situation. I'll tell you a situation very concrete that happened this morning on the streets of Hoboken, where Claudia and I live. And on my way to the cafe this morning, I bumped into an uh, older woman who uh, I know from around town, and I know she's a Trump supporter. Order, you know, I won't mention her name, <laughs> but she said to me, "Hi, how are you?" I said, "Well, you know, every morning I wake up and I'm actually still alive. That the world hasn't been blown up by Trump is a good day." <laughs> and she got angry. You know, she was like, hey. "But I think there's truth to that, and I think people realize that." So the question becomes, how? given his fascistic qualities, given his instability, which was on display even during the campaign, how did he get so many people to vote for him? So that, I think, requires a deeper analysis of American culture, of trends in politics and our educational system, our media. Um, Like, for example, I think of why you can't get on the bigger shows. I always say that. Like, now, Lawrence O'Donnell had your friend Francis Fox Piven on, which means that conceivably you could be on there too uh, conceivably our show could grow bigger and get a larger audience but I, I I'm always sort of pivoting back to that idea that the people who voted for Trump all went through an educational system that either taught them how to think or taught them how not to think so educational system systemic transformation not just tinkering reforms around the edges, but deep changes to really empower people what to think. Knowledge and critical theory, that's, uh, you know, even even on the high school level, but certainly at the college level, questioning the business major, the fact that you have so many people who study finance and very narrowly, who don't have the kind of breadth of knowledge you have, Stephen. The only reason I know who you are is because I started going to the left forum, which is this, I know you pulled away from it no. now, but you know, you're know you part of it, right? Yeah. But you, at the time, you were there, and so I got involved with intellectual groups in New York City, and from originally actually going to Judson Church in the village, believe it or not, that sure. was the first enclave of intellectual growth and development, and from there I got involved in organizations, I met people, there were coffee house conversations going on at the Moonstruck Diner in Chelsea, you know, twice a month on a Friday night having these deep intellectual conversations with my friend Bertram Miller, who was a student of Fran Piven, who, yeah. who knows about you, who when I told him that you were on our show, he got all excited, oh, I can't Very believe, he's like, now you getting the biggies now you're getting the biggies you know so but the problem is now it's hard to blame people for not knowing stuff right so you look at a trump supporter and you say well how do they vote for trump but what look if they if they knew what we know they might not have made that choice that decision you know it seems to me that this is one of those things which is a bit more complicated than uh, Mm -hmm. than we lay out now uh, one of the things that marks the Trump supporters is actually the lack of education, mm. right? Mm-hmm. These are uh, yeah. uh, whatever supporters uh, he has had, mm-hmm. which makes sense if you're in the most, uh, shall we say, retrograde elements of uh, of the working class, mm-hmm. retrograde uh, mm-hmm. industries like coal, or if you're in the uh, basically the uh, non-urban areas, or if you're in the South, right? Mm. The fear of modernity means there's a fear of education. uh, That's the first thing. The second thing, now having said that, uh, I guess I disagree with some of the, some of my friends in this. I think people have to take responsibility for what they do. 
Mm-hmm. And uh, the um, it's quite true that there's some people, some, some members of the uh, uh, of the Trump contingent, mm-hmm. um, who simply don't know. They've been socialized through their families, right. they've uh, mm-hmm. their, their particular churches mm-hmm. or synagogues, whatever. Mm. Uh, and I think that's that's a uh, that's a reasonable thing. I've had kids in my mm. introductory classes at say Rutgers the, University at Rutgers University okay. say the most unbelievable things. Mm. And my view is, any questions legitimate as long as it's in good faith. Mm. Mm. However, mm. I don't think that's the great majority of uh. of. Uh, of Trump supporters, uh, or let alone um, white nationalists or Nazis or whatever, it's, mm. it, this is it, this is not what it's about. Mm. What it's about is groups uh, is groups of people who, in their fear of modernity and the fear of education, also have a fear of the discourse. And simply the idea that we. What does we, that mean, fear of the discourse? In other words, yeah. if. Uh, did you ever notice how Trump always says, believe me? Right. Yeah? Yeah. Uh, uh-huh. <laughs> in other words, I don't have to argue my point. Uh, believe me. That's enough. Mm. It's an, it, by the yeah. way, this is also an old fascist uh, oh. uh, uh, demagogic uh, trick. Mm. Believe, me. believe me. I feel for you. Um, in uh, mm. in Nazi Germany, there was Ein Volk, Ein Führer, Ein Reich, one uh, people, one leader, one empire, and the three are linked. And the leader feels what the um, people feel, and he incarnates the possibilities of the Reich, I, uh, of the Reich or the empire. Uh, in any event, what that means is uh, also think about the attack on fake news. Mm. Mm. Right? right, right. So, right. what is not fake news? F- what is not fake news is what Trump and his supporters say. Right. Right. I mean, right. Th- because there's no criteria uh. to uh, to distinguish between the two. Mm. Uh, this preoccupation with symbols, mm-hmm. which, by the way, is on the left too. Mm. Mm. Uh, all of this, in a certain way, is an attempt to avoid discourse and, cri- and self-criticism when it comes to developing policies and programs. Mm. And it seems to me yeah. that we have to take that seriously. Mm. Mm. My book, The, the Bigot, hold uh, it, hold was... Hold it up. This is The Bigot by Steve Eric Bronner, Why Prejudice Persists. Which I'm actually Second very pr- proud of. Okay. Uh, the criticisms are, well, right. you're not kind enough mm-hmm. and not understanding enough, and not sympathetic enough mm. uh, or empathetic enough with the plight of uh, those Trump voters, especially uh, those, uh, those uh, workers. Well, I mean, it's like get a life. Mm. You have to take some responsibility for, what you, uh, for the decisions you make. Mm. And to me... The issue is not simply how do we engage in a discourse with these guys. Yeah. The issue is how do you marginalize these guys, mm. and that's a different that's a different discussion, oh. as far as I'm concerned. Wow. Yeah, wow. Uh, because the the kind of fluff liberalism mm. is what makes everybody sick. Yeah, mm. Marcuse, uh, Herbert Marcuse, the great critical theorist. And it's not a concept that I, uh, that I completely agree with, mm-hmm. but it's apt in this circumstance. He speaks about repressive tolerance. Mm. Yeah? Okay. And th- this attempt to, mm-hmm. I don't know, uh, simply reach out, <laughs> you know, with the emotional or the, uh, or the empathetic oh, yes. uh, classroom demeanor uh, to white nationalists, Nazis, and like, I mean, that's just crazy. Mm. That really, it's really a crazy situation. And if you look at the, at the actual history of uh, right-wing movements, 
of uh, Nazi movements, fascist movements, mm -hmm. what you find is the following. Mm -hmm. There is no, uh, as they grow and as crises occur, there is no interchange between socialists and liberals on the one hand mm -hmm. and, uh, and Nazis and fascists on the other. Mm -mm. It's not like in, during elections they, they sway. Yeah. It's true that, uh, that in 1932, in the elections mm -hmm. in Germany, there was an exchange between some communists moved over to the Nazis, some Nazis moved over to the communists. But I think that's very easy to explain at that point, which is both have the same authoritarian personality. Mm. Yeah? And that authoritarian personality, especially on the left, is something we have to educate away. Wow. And the authoritarian personality also, from what I understand, uh, somebody who's poor, who feels very low self-esteem, they could identify with a Trump because he's strong, he's virile, he's macho. So your own, your own, you sort of a substitute for your own self. The leader becomes your a substitute. Basically, it's true. Except I don't think this is a matter simply of poor. Okay. The uh, the Trump people, uh, the Tea Party people, were not. Is simply poor. I mean, these are not all uh, sharecroppers in the South. Right, right. They are uh, small business. They are contractors. Uh, they're white. Mm. They're uh, relatively privileged. Mm. Uh, they um, they st they are in fear, both existentially and practically. Mm. They fear the development of modernity insofar as it's going to erode their, their way of life. And it will. Mm. I mean, we have to, I think we have to be very upfront about that. Mm. If it were simply a question of poor, mm -hmm. why is it then that uh, you don't have blacks supporting Trump? You don't have, if it's simply so a question that of poor. guy behind him at the rally, at the last There's rally. always one. Okay. Right? There's always one. Um, but you don't have Latinos right. uh, support. You, you don't have the... Uh, the uh, groups that have really been through it and through the mill supporting, uh, supporting Trump. And no, no, the, uh, you could say it's because of the racism. You could say it's because of his racism, uh, his anti-immigrant policies and so on. Um, you could do all that. But, if it, but what this means is that the poor issue Mm. That's not it. Okay. You know, there's got there's got to be more involved than the poor. I think one of the things that sort of we haven't touched on yet um, is the fact that you know there was a valid critique, or there is a valid critique of the system up until now. You know, up until Trump, there was a, there was a famous study in 2012 or 13 that said that the America is no longer a functioning democracy because of big money, control of politics, a Princeton study. I think it was 2014. Now, Trump came along and he said, well, we're going to bring the jobs back. There was a critique of NAFTA, a valid critique from, from the left. So in a way, you would say Trump is moving into a left position when he criticized TPP, the only criticism of TPP I ever heard of is from left circles, intellectual circles, uh, you know, places like the Left Forum, anti-TPP, handing out flyers, TTP is bad, TTP is bad. Trump comes along and says, yeah, TPP is bad. And so there was a way that the neoliberal politicians were all kind of in sync with big money, with corporate, and Trump came in as this working class hero, at least he positioned himself that way. Uh, uh, you know, I, I feel your pain. It's hard to have it both. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. It's, it's sort of hard to have it both ways. I think a, a, a certain precision is necessary. The candidates with the big money in uh, uh, 2016 mm. were obviously Jeb Bush. Mm. Mm. Right? And mm. this didn't work out very well before him. Mm. Uh, now, of course, it's true that uh, the um, uh, Citizens United, which allows for uh, unlimited mm. 
uh, financing of, of campaigns yeah. from the outside is an absolute disaster oh. and is a, uh, a um, how should I put it, a, not just an impediment, but a real attack upon the idea of uh, voting and citizens' rights. Mm. No question about it. Mm. But at the same time, you see, at the same time, it's not a functioning democracy. How do we explain Bernie? Mm. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I, right. You know, right. one one has to be nuanced in these uh, mm. in these things. Mm. Um, my old teacher Henry Pactor, mm. who really was. Uh, mm. um, an anti-fascist, not just with the talk, but ah. he was in the resistance. Which college was that? This, uh, this was at City College. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, he was in uh, oh. in the Communist Party during the uh, oh. uh, early 20s, and then he was in the Socialist Party, and he was mm. in the resistance, mm. and he was in the Spanish Civil War. Wow. Yeah, I mean, so yes. uh, he, he t talked the talk. Wow. Henry, and he was a Marxist. Uh, uh, for m most of his life, he always took the position that said the key thing in any campaign, mm -hmm. the key thing in any uh, discussion of the left is solidarity. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. you, you can finesse many things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. One of the things you can finesse is money. Yeah. Think of Bernie. Uh, yeah. But what you can't finesse is commitment mm -hmm. and the willingness to sacrifice and he said unless you you push for that all the rest is wow. and i think that's true i really think that's true we've yeah. got to we've got to be uh, more critical of ourselves and i think uh mm -hmm. more critical of the way in which our thinking interferes with uh the quest for solidarity wow. one of the worst f and yeah. i was uh, since I was so often criticized for him, I might as well ta uh, take yeah. a little bit of credit. Okay. Uh, I really was very early in the critique of identity politics, going back to Berkeley. Good. Um, yeah, f easy to say now. Um, <laughs> the, but uh, I'm just, I, no, I'm right. just uh, okay. teasing. But you know, the, it, of course, it's true that mm -hmm. uh, these uh, that mm -hmm. social movements. Mm -hmm. uh, are the ways in which the left organizes. I mean, you can't simply deny that and yeah. say, well, we're waiting for a new... Uh, waiting for Godot. Uh, waiting, waiting for waiting Godot, for exactly. Okay. Uh, but at the same time, the kind of narrow identity politics yes. and the kind of, right. I, I should say, um, uh, I don't know, Let's call it the algebra of blood. Who is the uh, who is the biggest victim? This is unbelievably yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, counterproductive. Uh, counterproductive. Yeah, exactly, yeah, yeah, yeah. and I th uh, my, I think one of the things that uh, the Bernie campaign showed, and uh, that I think we're going to have to see more and more of, is activists within these different groups: women, uh, blacks. Latinos, the activists within these groups mm. talk about what kind of programs would be appealing not only to the working class uh, uh, members of their own organizations, but working class members of other organizations. In mm. short, uh, and that has to be concrete. That has to be through uh, mm. concrete programs. And I call that the class ideal. And working to, towards the class ideal, I think that's the way we have to move forward. Wow. Well, back in the 1960s, uh, there was that conflict between like the hippies and and the SDS and the student protesters and the and the labor or the uh, there was that famous photograph of the union, you know, the construction guys in New York going after the hippies. So there was that divide. I I remember being on a march in 2011 uh, when Occupy Wall Street was at its peak and there was a there was a solidarity march with the unions and Occupy Wall Street from Foley Square to Zuccotti Park mm -hmm. I mm -hmm. thought that was fantastic you were on that march as well um, so now I'm also thinking I explain that yeah, right yeah yeah so now the other th question I had in my mind and it was sort of a theory that's emerging with me that is do could Donald Trump be the John Gotti of capitalism <laughs> 
Now, here's what I mean by that. The old-time mafia guys were mustache peats. You know, they were very conservative in the way they dressed down. They drove in old sedans. They didn't want all the heat to come down on their system, okay? Along comes John Gotti, and he's very flashy and charismatic with his fancy suits. And they say, oh, my God, the, the jig is up with this guy. There's gonna, heat's going to come down, and boy, did the heat come down. Giuliani comes in, and he puts them all in. The Italian mafia was decimated. Now, we're in a time when capitalism is being critiqued more seriously with people like Thomas Piketty. His book became a bestseller. Occupy Wall Street, which fed into the Bernie Sanders candidacy, the first socialist popular in a long time. Along comes Donald J. Trump. And if anything, the anti-capitalist forces have someone to point to and say, oh, that's what you want? No, this is why we need socialism. Mm. How does that sound? Uh, sounds good to me. Um, uh, I mentioned Herbert Marcuse yeah. before, and in, uh, I think it was 1976, mm -hmm. he gave a set of lectures mm -hmm. at uh, Vincennes in, in France, at the, uh, mm -hmm. the university, mm -hmm. and there he spoke about the mafiaization of, of politics. Oh. Now, this is an old theme okay. within, the, uh, within the left. Uh, uh, Bert Brecht, always uh, the great, mm, great, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the great playwright, always said it's a much bigger crime to build a bank than to rob one. <laughs> and uh, I love it, I love uh, it. <laughs> even Balzac, who was not on the left, oh. but uh, the, the, this line was taken over. He mm. once said, "You look at every great f behind every great uh, fortune, there's a great crime." <gasps> uh, and this was a very dominant uh, theme, and you could see you can see it in the movies in the twenties. If you think of M, the great film with Peter Lorre, or you think of Bert Brecht with the Three Penny Opera, or I mean, but this is becoming, and and by the way, it's also true with Hitler and and uh, and Mussolini. Mussolini's support came from thugs and mafia. But also mafia people. Also mafia. Oh. Yeah. And um, in any event, it's, I think, true that this is starting to flower in a new way. If you think of Berlusconi, who's probably the closest guy around today to, uh, to mm -hmm. Trump, right, mm -hmm. uh, in terms of style and mm -hmm. the type of stuff you're talking about. This is also the, this unbelievable corruption. I mean, mm. you know, you, we went through eight years of Obama, mm -hmm. right? I can't remember a single person who was mm. indicted or not mm. just indicted, mm -hmm. where there was this super concern over uh, fraudulent behavior, financial mis uh, mismanagement, uh, corruption, let alone corrupt uh, bribery. I mean, okay, you, you do have that with Hillary to a degree, but not like this. I mean, this is com it, this is crazy. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Paul Manafort, Mike Flynn, oh. Jared Kushner. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you can go down the yeah. list. Yes, yes. And what do you find? You uh, you find this ongoing slime mm -hmm. everywhere. Mm -hmm. uh, and what's interesting is, on the one hand, we have the slime faction, and on the other hand, we have the military. Mm -hmm. You know that uh, that sort of uh, instead of talking perhaps about the military-industrial complex, although that does work, how about military-industrial? A uh, mob context that might work. Yeah, it might work. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Well, the question must be asked: How do we create a world that's more kind, just, loving, caring? Um, you know, that's peaceful. How do we how do we get rid of warfare completely? 
I know these are utopian ideas, but I think utopian ideas ought to be ought to be much more uh, in in the common currency. And thinking about that, I'm looking at a book of yours that I just discovered last year because you gave me a copy of it uh, called <laughs> Modern. And I found it here in this lovely look at the bookshelf, honey. Just take a look at this beautiful apartment that we're in in Fortley, New Jersey. I always like to give our audience a glimpse of the place where we are. Scan around, my dear, and look at this beautiful. Uh, couch, the golden couch. I call it the golden couch. Golden this is this is where we'll be sitting and sipping coffee, and that co that cake is delicious. That that coffee. Oh, oh well, if Trump can have the chocolate cake, <laughs> why can't you? You yeah, know. Right. Yeah. You see that we know how to live here yeah. on the left. The progressives know how to. It's too good for the proletariat. That's right. What the communists used to say. <laughs> Uh, and, and, and so this book uh, by Stephen is called Modernism at the Barricades. What a great title. Speaking of barricades, right? You think, well, Donald Trump is president. Why are there, are there not millions of people in the streets, like immediately, right, if not sooner? And this book, the subtitle is Aesthetics, Politics, and Utopia. So I am getting so much out of this book, so much of an appreciation of modern art that I didn't know about. But again, weirdly enough, that was my... Uh, that, uh, weirdly enough, that was a hobby of mine. Oh. I never, um, uh, yeah, I never really studied uh, art or uh, art history, but it became a, a hobby. And I think it was in maybe 1982 or something mm -hmm. like that. Uh, Doug Kellner and I, uh, Douglas Kellner, the, who really is a great critical theorist, uh, one of the great ones that Amer America's produced, mm. he and I did a book, uh, did a collection on expressionism, mm. and I, I just was into modern art, oh. and so that's a collection of essays. It was oh. written more for fun than uh, uh, any than anything else, but I really enjoyed uh, writing this thing, oh. and uh, I think Utopia. You know, it, yes. if we make, the, if we recognize that utopia has to remain utopian, mm. right? In other words, you can't re, you can't realize it almost by definition. Uh, it can serve some very useful functions. For example, if um, you mm. take something simple, let's say uh, Immanuel Kant, the great philosopher, talked about the need for eternal peace. Mm. Now. He never believed you're going to get eternal peace, but what he did believe was that you have to think about it in order to even get temporary peace. And I think that's true with a lot of uh, a, a lot of other um, ideals. We have to we have to be more we have to be clear about our ideals. And so let me say something that many of your people I think won't like. Um, Noam Chomsky called uh, the Antifa's uh, mm. a gift to the right. And I understand what he was talking about. Mm. Uh, the Antifa's, of course, were those who uh, fought against the white nationalists mm -hmm. and uh, their ilk in, uh, Charlotte, in Charlottesville. On the left, we have to, we have to stand for principle. The uh, stand up for print. It's very difficult. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and uh, that Antifa position, by the way, was a position that goes back again to the communists in the 1920s. Strike the, strike the fascist where he stands. Mm. That, was the, uh, that was the position that was put forward. It was by the, mm. the in the German Communist Party, it was uh, the big person behind it was Hans Neumann, if I remember right. Mm -hmm. Anyway, uh, this is not a position. Mm -hmm. uh, this is, uh, in a certain way, purely reactive, A. Uh, B, it's childish. I mean, it's, it's uh, simply giving in to your emotions. What is? The, um, the, the Antifa position. Oh, okay, okay. It's giving in to emotions. Mm -hmm. It's not having a positive perspective mm -hmm. to lay out, okay, you're anti-fascist. If, if, and here's your business with education. Yeah. Anti-fascism was connected with a positive vision in oh, the 1930s. Right. 
for better or worse, it was, uh, if you think of the, um, in France, where it was the most remarkable uh, uh, demonstration of solidarity. 1968, and, May of 68. No, no 19, 1936. Oh, okay. oh. That was the uh, time of the Popular Front. Oh, yeah. Um, and the, uh, the uh, Popular Front was anti-fascist. Popular Front means you bring together the different parties, uh, mm. liberal, socialist, communist, mm. and the great one of the great demonstrations in modern yeah. uh, history was in on July fourteenth, nineteen thirty six. Huh. The leader of the Popular Front was one of my very few political heroes, huh. uh, Leon Blum, okay. and huh. Blum uh, put forward an agenda. Mm. There were uh, there was an entire array of socialist. Uh, uh, proposals, legislative demands, and the like. There was, aside from clear, um, clear ideals put forward as well, support for the republic, support for uh, uh, social justice, support for what today we would call human rights. This all uh, came, uh, and internationalism, all of this came together. And here, what we have is an attack on the on the right, without that positive component, and without that positive component, mm. uh, basically, uh, the left becomes defined by what it opposes. Mm. Yeah, this doesn't mean they're the same. I mean, it's, uh, it is almost not even worthy of discussion. It doesn't mean it's the same, but it does mean that we wind up in a situation where we can't see outside the box. And it seems to me that uh, th that, that is the key to this. We have to get over understanding politics as a, as a kindergarten in which, uh, you know, we let our emotions uh, uh, fly. Uh, and I don't believe that the threat was, that it's simply the threat and the seriousness of this situation. You can say that all the time. Martin Luther King could have said that. Yeah. Gandhi could have said that, and mm -hmm. certainly could have said that. Um, Mandela could have said that. Uh, but they didn't say that. They put forward a set of principles and they, mm -hmm. and they helped build a legacy for the left mm -hmm. that we can build on. And that's what's lacking today, mm -hmm. in my view. Mm -hmm. Same thing with critical theory. Okay. Unless critical theory can build mm -hmm. its critique mm -hmm. on positive foundations, mm -hmm. it's worthless, in my view. And maybe the arts can play a part of this. Maybe, maybe novels, uh, sure. di different kinds of, of, of books and narratives, maybe, maybe, maybe different kinds of movies that show a kind of more utopian society, a world in which happiness is much sure. more widespread. We need uh, regulative ideals, but we have to be clear uh, that they're regulative. And to have regulative ideals and utopian ideals doesn't excuse you yeah. from... Uh, the need to have actual strategies that speak to the real problems of people in the mm. present. Mm. I mean, it's not yeah. uh, people. Uh, uh, people can't simply uh, survive on dreams. Okay. Dreams are necessary, but yeah. Yeah. Uh, there has to be the bread as well as uh, yeah. as well as the, uh, the as well as the ideals. Well, our friend, our mutual friends, uh, uh, Rick, Rick Wolf, the economist, and his wife, in particular, Harriet Fraud, has a, has a critique of capitalism where she brings in psychology. She's also a great psychotherapist, and she says people feel bad in our society. It creates depression and unhappiness. You know, people are overworked, they're coming home exhausted, uh, and she points out, she likes to point out that America is 5% of the world's population, and we have 
have, we consume 66% of the psychological medications. So you have a lot of unhappiness around. And yet people are watching all these TV shows that are proliferating like on Netflix and you gotta watch this show and you gotta watch that show. What are these shows, are they, are they addressing any, any can, can, can we create a different kind of show? I often think that these shows, they all seem like they're written by, they're written by the same, I call it the MFA creative writing mafia. They're all the same, come out of the same school, and that there's a sameness to all these TV shows. They don't go critical and deep into the issues that are going on. They, they sort of normalize capitalism in the way, oh, so now we're working, and now here we are at the office, but they're not questioning the fact that we, we have a, a work week that's too long, all these basic issues. So the popular culture becomes a way of domesticating people's hopes and dreams and, and intellect. Does that make any sense? Uh, it makes a lot, it, that makes a lot of sense. And I think, uh, I think you're definitely on to something. You can see the same plots yeah. emerging on all the different sitcoms. Well, and uh, yeah, I mean, it's sort, of, it's sort of like interchangeable. You yeah. can make a fortune having one idea. <laughs> and you just repackage uh, it. Um, yeah, that's true. Uh, and uh, what I'm struck by is how um, on TV and so on, there's no emphasis on thinking. Yes. Everything is everything is street sense. Yeah. And so you're defined by the f thug you oppose. It's the mm. same thing. It's what we're conditioned mm. to do, mm. right? Um, it, you know, it's how do I get over, not how should I be uh, conducting myself. Uh, mm. And even when the principles are brought to, into play, it's the tough individualist. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. throw up. Oh. What happened to the idea of solidarity wow. in terms of groups? It's completely, uh, completely ignored. Wow. Well, I just wanted to share with the public, if I may, uh, one of my books, uh, which uh, is... Uh, titled uh, My Life as a Novel, My Life as a Novel, and you see me on the cover there, uh, actually with these three statues. <laughs> Believe it or not, this book came out way before this whole statue controversy. <laughs> but but these are not Confederate statues, I want people to know that. This is uh, George Washington, uh, Alexander Hamilton, <laughs> And, and Lafayette, and this is in Monk, this is in uh, Marstown, New Jersey. So let me see what you got here, just for the joke. With uh, Washington, we have a slave owner. Right, I know. With um, <laughs> Hamilton, we have the actual prophet of modern capitalism. Okay, okay. And with Lafayette, we have an aristocrat. Well done! Embar I'm embarrassed now. <laughs> What it shows, yes, is yes. That, okay, uh, yes. on a serious level, yes. what it shows is that people can, in their private lives, okay. be uh, fairly disgusting. Uh, uh, yeah. But in the public realm, do really positive things. Uh, and I think that's the part that has to be uh, highlighted. In this, It's not how did you feel in your private life. Right. What matters is how did you act in your uh, public life. What stand did you take in the Civil War? What stand did you take in the, uh, in the uh, uh, actually, it's, it's particularly relevant now. Mm -hmm. do, the, do the Republicans get off the hook because now they, uh, now they criticize Trump? Mm -hmm. I mean. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, just to explain what my meaning of, of, the, of the cover is that it's, I know, I know, I love the joke, it was great. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we have a sense of humor on our show, by the way. We, but humor is important, you know. Pat Cooper was one of our guests, a great, oh, really? great Italian comic, Pat yeah. Cooper. Yeah. We become friends. I call him once a month. He's still a funny as heck, you know, 88 years old. Guy is amazing. He's incredible. I'm trying to talk him into getting back on stage. I think he'd be. I said, Pat, you'd knock him dead on Broadway. There's nobody saying what he's saying out there. He's a, he's inc incredible. So here, what I'm trying to do is have a conversation with politics to try to be relevant, to try to be part of of history, to be part of history. And the subtitle of this book is Manifesto on the Activist as Hero and Other Ways to Not Be Bored, because I oh, do think I think. Number one, activism should be seen as more worthy of recognition instead of the same genuflecting to people like Kim Kardashian and Donald Trump, who became famous before he became president. 
I think fame itself as a category needs to be interrogated and critiqued. Who are we holding up for recognition? And and you know, and 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 other ways to not be bored means I think people maybe we elected Trump because we were bored and we want some you know, we were so bored of politics as usual. I, was elected. I think Trump was elected because of the uh, primarily racist backlash to uh, Obama. Um, oh, okay. it, it, see, you can't let people off the hook. Okay. Uh, you can't let those supporters off uh, the hook. Okay. Uh, so when Hillary, this, when Hillary, when they said that you shouldn't say deplorables, and then she backed off, but you don't think we should stick with the deplorables? Yeah. It's uh, in ethical terms. Oh. It's disgusting, yeah. in my view. Yeah. yeah. And uh, yeah. yeah, and uh, it it seems to me, from the standpoint of the Republicans, it's even more disgusting because their position was. Mm. Uh, the mainstream. Well, we can control these guys. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's exactly what uh, uh, the cabinet of the barons said in the 1930s uh, mm. about Hitler when they brought oh. him to power. Look, it's not, you know, he, he's crude, he's a barbarian, but, you know, we get him into power, oh. we, got, we got this. Wow. And you don't got this. Wow. I think we have how long? Two minutes left, two minutes left, two precious minutes with the great professor at Rutgers. Now, I want everyone to see how close we are to the television here. Now, I think, th I think there's a metaphorical meaning here that this is the man we want to see on TV more often when we channel surfing, you know, and Donald, uh, Lawrence O'Donnell, are you watching? This is the guy you should have on. So, two minutes left, two minutes, left. he's humble, but I'm going to speak for him. I'm his agent now. No. Um, so, I get a cut. No, I'm only kidding. Um, you get a cut. You figure it out. <laughs> a minute and a half, quick, uh, sort of two-minute drill in football, right? Some hopes for our audience. Okay, you were the student of Ernst Bloch, the great philosopher of hope. How can you keep our hopes alive? Progressives, uh, 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 quick elevator speech on how to keep our hopes strong and what to do. Well, what to do will hang on. Okay. The, but how to keep your hopes alive? Yes. If you don't ha uh, keep your hopes alive, you're not doing politics. Oh. It's that simple. Yes. The, uh, as soon as you say, well, there's no hope, yeah. then you might as well not do anything. Mm -hmm. And this, of course, becomes a c an excuse and a self-fulfilling prophecy. Mm. Uh, mm. Your politicians are not saints. Right. What, what they are is politicians mm. and political activists are not saints for the most part mm. but solidarity means that you're able to overcome and and it's history has shown that right. we're able to overcome at times at yes. particular moments mm. what divides us our worst political instincts mm -hmm. our worst uh social instincts okay. it's possible to stand together if we're clear what we're standing for. Wow. And I think the two, yeah. basically, yes. two issues that are derived yeah. from the Enlightenment okay. tradition, okay. liberalism and socialism, and we've got to make them fit. Wonderful. Thank you. So well put. At home with Stephen Eric Bronner, the Rutgers professor, uh, member of uh, U.S. Academics for Peace, okay? A great uh, expert on critical theory and with his lovely wife, Annie. We're enjoying some wonderful cosmopolitan sensibility here in their Fortley home. It's always a pleasure to spend some time with you, uh, Stephen, and the conversation will go on. I hope so. Thank you so much. Okay.